welcome welcome to this wonderful readings and Simon and Schutzer event what a pleasure we have the lovely Alice Robertson who will be joining us in conversation with Tegan what a complete treat to have such an experienced and warm and loving author with us I just know that you are going to be swept away by her energy and kindness in the same way that I have been for years now. Dr. Alice Robinson is such a great friend of readings and she has supported us in so many different ways. She's also an award-winning author and her last book blew my mind and I'm going to send each of you a little tab so that you too can have that experience. So let's go back to how we're going to begin this evening. So questions that you might want to ask Tegan, send them through to me on the chat function and I'll make sure that Alice gets them. Uh, if you want to save your broad width, and that actually is a very easy thing to do, just pop yourself off video, as lovely as it is, for me to see your lounge room, to see your kitchen, to see your bedroom. You know what? You can save yourself a lot of hassle by taking yourself off video. And again, put yourself self on that speaker view because that means that you are going to be eavesdropping on quite an extraordinary conversation between Alice and Tegan as they talk about the love of reading. Could there be a better way to spend a Thursday evening? I don't think so. To you Alice. Thank you Chris. I'd also Thanks, like Chris. to acknowledge the sovereign owners and traditional custodians of the land from which I'm hosting this event, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to any First Nations people we have here tonight. As Chris said, I'm Alice Robinson and I'm the author of two novels and it's an absolute thrill to introduce you to one of my favourite Australian writers. She evokes Martin Amos, who said that when you love a writer, you really only love about half their work. But I'd like to put it on the record that I love Tegan Bennett Daylight's body of work in its entirety. And in fact, um, her work is probably, or the book that we're here to talk about tonight, The Details, is the only book that I've ever recommended to girlfriends by saying, if you're really short for time, strapped for time, just read the chapter on the vagina. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that tonight as well. So we're here to talk about the details. Tegan's a writer, a teacher and a critic. She's the author of three novels, Bombora, What Falls Away and Safety, as well as several books for children and teenagers. Her collection of short stories, Six Bedrooms, was shortlisted for the ALS Gold Medal, the Steel Rudd Award and the 2016 Stella Prize. Tegan, I want to start by asking you, and I hope this isn't jumping too much into the deep end straight away, but what's, what do you think that literature is doing to us when we're reading and what can it do? And maybe another way of asking that is, um, why should we read? Mm, I love it when you jump in the deep end. That's fantastic. What is it doing to us? Well, I um, read with my body. I think, I think I've sort of figured this out after quite some time. So um, for me, literature is doing something to my breathing. I, I'm sure it's doing something to my brain and it's teaching me things and all of that sort of stuff. But actually, um, a good sentence uh, settles my breathing. I don't know why. And so I read the way some people swim laps or go for long walks or do something meditative. It seems and always has seemed to calm me down. Um, why would we do it? It's a, such an interesting question because sometimes I'm sort of asked to defend reading as though, you know, uh, it's this kind of poor relation of everything else kind of struggling away there in the corner. And I never, I never think of it like that. And I never want to think of it like that. Um, sometimes people say to me, uh, you know, reading breeds empathy. And I'm like, Oh yeah, you know, whatever. <laughs> I, um, 
do it in order to feel uh, connected to other people. For some reason, it's a, quite a social kind of process for me, reading, reading and talking about books. And I do it for company. And I do it when everybody else is doing something else, if you know what I mean, in the private spaces of my life. It's interesting to me that you say that readings are kind of a social activity. And I definitely understand that in the context of um, when you love a book and, and you're in a, in a kind of a community of people who love that book and it's like you're all connected in the kind of in the thought or in the, the landscape of that work. But is there something that's lonely about reading as well? Like you talk about um, reading as kind of being a way into art and I definitely understand that as kind of alleviating loneliness. But what about the division, if indeed that is, there is a division between readers and non-readers? Is there something about being a reader and having a particular body of work inside you that separates you from other people who maybe haven't read those books or who don't read at all? I guess, I guess so. And I went right through high school only really having one or two friends at a time. I mean, I sort of had a circle of friends, but, but intense or close friends, I really only had a couple of them. And when I went to university at 17, I suddenly found myself in the company of people who valued reading and it was this explosion of social life for me because all of a sudden this thing that I'd been doing in private and that I was a bit obscurely ashamed of suddenly became currency and I had um, I had value uh, so you know I guess it does it might separate me from the non-readers but it doesn't feel as though it does because the reading feels as though it connects me to people reading or not reading it kind of makes me feel alive in a really really interesting way so I talk in the book a bit about um, Helen Garner and about how when I first read Monkey Grip when I was about 15, it just um, made me look at the world that I was inhabiting in a new way. It sort of um, added life to it. Instead of taking it away because of this strange solitary process of reading, it added things to it. And I think I said at the end of that essay that sometimes I feel as though if I didn't read, I would have no memory. Something reading is so deeply imprinted in who I am and what I do that it kind of forms the way I feel and think about things. It sounds odder and odder every time I re-describe it. <laughs> yes, it's interesting. I haven't thought about it in these terms, but when you're talking about reading, I'm, I'm reminded of how hard it is also to talk about what you're doing when you're doing writing. But I've mm. never thought about reading in those terms, maybe because I think of it as being more ubiquitous, like that it's something that everyone does, whereas writing's more specialised. About that, that Ghana chapter, I was, you know, like many readers in Australia, and especially maybe women who read, I'm, I'm a big Ghana fan. And I was interested in this thing you said, I'm looking at my notes because I want to get it right. You said she'd followed a consciousness that did not bend easily into a more traditional shape of a novel. You could say she'd written a women, woman's novel. And I was thinking about this idea of a woman's novel and I, I was thinking, are you talking about what she's writing about, the subject matter? Or are you talking, I mean, in that little bit that I read out, you seem to be talking about style or structure or is it yeah. all things together? What is going on there? Yeah, it's definitely all. And I often find form um, is indivisible from content for me. So mm -hmm. I find it hard to separate them. But I guess um, for me, I mean, obviously there have been magnificent novels written by women over the years and... I'm a huge reader of Jane Austen and George Eliot and um, the Brontes as well. But probably the first of those women's novels, I would say, was um, uh, To the Lighthouse. So there's something that Wolf tries to do, and again, it's a bending, is bending her work to consciousness, to female consciousness. And so it does something to the content but it also does something to the form. And when I read Monkey Grip, um, you know, I was already a very wide reader and I'd read a, a lot of perfectly formed novels and a lot of ill-formed novels and a lot of everything. But when I read Monkey Grip, it was like, 
this seems to move the way I think. And I guess that's how I feel about To The Lighthouse as well. So, of course, men can do that as well, but it's just that um, there's something particular, something particularly womanly to me in, in Garner's writing, as in Wolf's, actually. Is it something, because you talk also in, in your book, there are beautiful sections where you describe the importance of your women friends and the conversations that you're having with those friends as a kind of both an intellectual pursuit and like a kind of a joy about living. And maybe I'm just thinking as you're describing your relationship to Ghana's writing, that maybe it, it evokes that experience of yeah, talking. Yeah, it does. And in fact... I think um, you've reminded me that the other thing that I feel about reading and I felt really, really early on is this um, this sense of being included in a conversation and a really real conversation. Because when you read someone's work, you know how they think. If you read closely enough, you can feel the way in which they think. So it doesn't matter when they were born, what gender they are, what ethnicity they are, whatever. If you understand their book, you understand them. And so... Yeah, the reading is a, is a kind of continuous conversation. And I've, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I was very um, keen to join that conversation from, from a very young age, particularly marked by the moment when I wrote to, as a six-year-old, I wrote to Elizabeth Beresford, who wrote the Wombles books. <laughs> and this is very typical of me. I didn't write to say, you're so great. Thanks so much. I wrote to, to give her some ideas. I, I suggested a few plots. <laughs> And she wrote back and said, nice one. Actually, I've already written one that's a bit like that. She was, it was a lovely, she got it. It was a lovely letter. She understood that I, that I was a very active reader and that I needed to be able to talk to her about it. Why do you think, because I was thinking about that too, and I was thinking there are so many voracious readers who never become writers themselves and don't have any ambition to necessarily, but I really mm. related personally to that idea of wanting to join the conversation that you talk about in the book. So why do you think, is it a personality thing that leads some voracious readers to become writers and not others? Or what is oh, that's so interesting. I wish we could suddenly flip everybody's... Um everybody's mics on because I can see that in our crowd is one of my oldest friends Kate and I've never said this to her but I'm going to say it to you now Kate often when I write I think of Kate Kate's not a writer she's got a huge visual talent and she designs things and makes things beautiful but she's also a great reader she's one of those rare people that just reads everything so why is she not a writer? I would say because she's got a visual gift and that's her thing. When you become a writer, it is about joining the conversation, but it's also because you just can't put the words down. You're, you know, I was up late at night doing things and I was um, typing into the night. I was coming home from parties drunk and then sitting down at my little Mac Classic and starting to type again. But even from a really young age, I was really obsessed with sentences and the tilt of sentences. So I think it comes upon you, and I bet you it was the same for you, it comes upon you without you realising you're doing it. You're just so fascinated by it that you can't put it down. You know, my son's got friends who are very musical and they're the same. They walk into the house and one of them's just like, just stop playing the piano for a second. They just can't not. So I think that's why you do it. You can't not. Mm, I love that answer. I think that's true. Um, I was thinking about... Um, the way the, the beautiful passages that you describe your mother, your mother's relationship to reading and how she shaped your reading and then also the lovely through line in terms of how you're doing that with your own children. But then I was also thinking about how, and that was certainly an experience that I had in my childhood too that led me into this life really, but do you think that it's possible, and, and if so, how to come to reading if you don't grow up in that kind of house? Your know, readings, you know, happening. Yeah, well. yeah, that that's interesting. It must be um, something innate. It's like, I mean, I sometimes think about people who are musical. What did they do before there were musical instruments? Hmm. Did they things to hear what they sounded like, or did they stand in forests listening to the wind? So, what do you do? How do you become a reader if you haven't got books around you? 
I don't I don't really know. I used to think I used to think that becoming an addicted reader came from a facility with reading. Um, one of my kids, Paddy, just started reading at four. So we, he wasn't taught. He just did it. It was really, it was fascinating and a little bit gratifying, as you can imagine. <laughs> but he's not a huge reader. It's his sister, Alice, who she, she was taught to read and she learned at five and a half and learned very quickly and she's now completely addicted to it, whereas Paddy can take it or leave it. So I don't, I don't know, except that I have worked with kids at regional universities who've come from towns that have no library and no bookshop and houses that have not a single book in them. And every so often you come across one who, I, I tell a story in, in, in the book about a young woman who was working as a dairymaid and that, that was her word, by the way. I, that's, not, that's not me imposing that word. Sometimes people send me dairymaid. <laughs> she called herself. She was a dairymaid. So she worked with cows. She'd never really read anything and she thought she was too stupid to go to university. And then she read a Helen Garner essay about um, overcoming nerves in sort of starting an art. And then she read a poem by Les Murray called The Cows on Killing Day. She was sitting at the back of the class and she suddenly said, this is exactly what it's like. And she just exploded. She went from getting passes, kind of, you know, meandering along to getting distinctions and then high distinctions, and then she changed to English. So maybe that's the way a reader becomes. She, she'd she been outdoors all of her life with animals. She wasn't indoors with books, but suddenly she turned up at university. There she was. It was very thrilling. And it's something about what you're describing is something about that, um, the spark of recognition Potentially, yeah. you know, you see yeah. something that you know to be true, but you can't articulate maybe. Yeah, that's right. It was, I, I think, I mean, it seems hard to imagine when you're that solipsistic creature, a writer where you constantly think about what you're thinking. <laughs> you, know, you, just, you never get away from yourself, bit of a nightmare. But she was somebody who'd never been asked what she was thinking. And suddenly Les Murray told her what she was thinking in a sense. Yes. It was a, quite a remarkable thing to see. So beautiful. I was interested in this like sort of one of the arguments that you're kind of putting forward in the book and I want to ask you about it because you say in the details that you want literature to know women's lives mm -hmm. and you talk about Ghana saying that literature can be a stepping stone towards life which is so beautiful and that it can be a way of knowing ourselves and our society but then you also later on in the book say that you don't want literature to, t to teach you about life, that you're interested, for example, in how Austin yeah. writes, not what she writes. So what's that distinction there? Like it's doing yeah. both things at once or? I think it's a good, it, you make a good point, Alice. I think one of the things I'm resisting is um, someone like me as, a, as an academic and as a writer is constantly called upon to justify literature's existence. And I've become really weary of doing it. And I sometimes just feel like saying, I don't give a shit, read, don't read, I don't care what <laughs> you want to do. So I do sometimes make these statements about it doesn't teach me. I'm not reading it in order to be a better person. But, but you, you've, you've caught me in a contradiction. I think you're absolutely right. I think... Um, even though I'm kind of resisting um, having to tell people that it's good for them and they should have it every day, you know, the way they should exercise or drink water. I do really resist that. But at the same time, I do genuinely believe that it is good for you and that it does teach you about life and that it is a place you can live before you're fully living your life in a really um, thrilling and safe way, both thrilling and safe at the same time. It's so true because especially well, as a reader and a writer, I'm often caught in this kind of tension between like wanting to have an exciting life and knowing that that will take me away from the things that I actually need to be doing each day. I just yeah. want to remind the people listening, the audience, that if you've got any questions for Tegan, you can send them to Chris and I can pose them to her as we're talking. Um, let me think what else, so much to talk about. Um, maybe we can talk about the essay, the vagina essay. In I the, knew we'd get there. <laughs> everybody who interviews you and 
um, enters into conversation with you will want to talk about that essay because it is, it's so powerful and, and, and it's so startling to read because it sort of seems so obvious in the sense that um, if you are a woman and you have a vagina, then it's a familiar terrain and yet it's sort of unspoken as you talk yeah. about in that essay. Yeah. Um, I don't know, if, would you like to say something about it before I get yeah, into Yeah, yeah. Just, just for those, those of our um, watchers, our audience who haven't read it, it's uh, an essay, it's called Vagina and it details, uh, details, it details my two, the two births I had with my daughter first, my daughter Alice. Alice is very thrilled that you are an Alice. <laughs> um, Alice and Patrick. And uh, I sustained some damage from both of those births, as many women do, and that ended in a prolapsed bladder. And so I didn't have any pain, but I did have um, this this odd constant feeling of, I can only describe it as like a bulge in my vagina. So, you know, all of us, I think it might even be all of us here who have vaginas, most of us anyway, um, you don't really notice it. It's, it's a pivot or a hinge, but you don't, you don't notice it unless you're thinking about having sex or you're having a wee or something like that. You don't, it's not like penis and testicles. You don't need to adjust it a lot or anything like that. But when it's got something in it, that you can't get rid of, you start to really notice it. So I became very frustrated. I wasn't in pain, but I became frustrated by it. And it was impeding on um, the pleasure of my life in all sorts of ways, sexual pleasure, as well as, as well as just the pleasure of being unconscious of my body. Um, and so I had it operated on and I was very lucky. I had a great surgeon and it was fixed and I'm um, doing really well. But I did find um, during that period, which was a long period, it was about five, six, seven years, that people, we, other women would talk about it. It wasn't that they were trying to prevent me talking about it. It was just that I was always the one starting the conversation. And um, I also, at the same time, started to, to think, God, I'm thinking about this all the time, and yet I never see this in books. I'm reading so many books, and I've never seen a vagina. And at the same time, I was reading um, a lot of Carl Uwe Knausgaard. I was caught up in the sort of wave of everybody reading him. And I, I found his work really, really compelling and still do. Um, and I started to think, well, everybody's happy to read his sort of daily routine, you know. If my daily routine turns out to be thinking about my vagina, are people going to read it? Is that going to find its way into a book? So I started to look at the books I was reading and the books that I loved and to realise how absent our bodies were from them. So... I wrote that essay because I couldn't stop myself. It just all kind of came out of me fairly quickly, but it was also just a way of starting a conversation that it felt to me we hadn't had yet. And you're both kind of demonstrating, like talking about the issues around women's lives being documented and then demonstrating that by leading by example with that essay, I felt. One of the things that really struck me in that essay was, which I really related to having had two births of my own, was this sense that when you're in labour, it was very clear to me, or after labour, you know, you think of all the women who have died in childbirth. And it's yeah, the kind of the everyday fact of the world, it seemed to me. Like, oh, a lot of women have died historically and do die in childbirth. And later I thought, that's almost like I, I, I said that to myself as though I was saying, like, I'm just going to make a cup of tea. And we, a lot of women die in childbirth, you know, so yeah. normalised. But, but then, as you point out in that essay, we don't know any of the details. No, no, that. we don't. And childbirth, uh, it's, the, uh, it's, it's another planet of pain, isn't it? You don't. It doesn't relate to any other pain you've ever had. And you cannot describe it to somebody who hasn't been through it. It is... It's an out-of-body pain. It's so out there. And afterwards, I thought, my God, to die of that pain, just, or, or to die because that pain won't progress anywhere. Because one of the things that you have during birth is you just like, just be born, be born. Then I'll, then I'll be free of the pain. I mean, I'm sure there are lots of excellent women who, who thought hard about their baby's health, but I thought very hard about my own health during those births, it was like, get this over with as quickly as possible. 
And to die of that pain seemed like just the most punishing torture that I could possibly imagine. And, and yeah, we just, we, we don't talk about it. In fact, um, when the kids were at primary school, one of the mums did die in childbirth, one of, the, one of our local mums. And uh, there was an unbelievable outpouring from the school when, we, when you walked into um, the office the walls of the office were piled with gifts because the baby survived, but she didn't. And she had, um, she had a daughter in Alice's year and she had a son uh, around the same age as Patty and she had this new baby. So her husband was alive and the, the kids were alive and, and the little boy was alive, the baby was alive. But you could see this just, yeah, just explosion of, we can't bear that this has happened in these, just these gifts just lining the school hall. And, and yeah, it was, I think that was a moment when I, I understood that I wasn't the only one who understood it. Yes. Is there something about, because when I was thinking, as I was reading that um, chapter about uh, the narratives that do exist about birth and labor, I was thinking that there are like, People, women in particular have had a go at trying to talk about the pain part and then the baby and you quite rightly say in that chapter you know that you're not going to belabor the kind of the early stages of motherhood because a lot has been written about that is there something about that pain though that actually makes it quite hard for women who've been through it to narrativize it in some way yeah. you write about it because you're if you're going to be the subject it's really hard if you're actually also the bearer of that pain yeah, yeah, and it's really lovely, thank you, to be asked so closely about it because one of the sentences, I keep, ask, I keep waiting for somebody to pull me up on this sentence so I can then explain it to them. There's a sentence that says, um, the, my labour with Alice moved too quickly for me to adapt my training to it because, you know, before your first labour, you've done all the classes and everything, you think, oh, yeah, I'll breathe and I'll do that, whatever. Um, now, that was a nine-hour labour. So that's actually really good for a first labor, but anybody who hasn't experienced labor would not think that how could that possibly move too quickly, but you've given birth, you know, what moves quickly is the waves of pain. So you don't have any time to think I'll do this now because you, your whole body is preventing you. I mean, I, I really was spending a great deal of time, trying not to run against the wall and smash my head against it to kill myself. You know, it was that, it was that severe. I could not, I couldn't think straight because of the pain. So everything kind of sped past me. It was so, so impossible to catch up to at the same time. It went forever and ever and ever. It just, it just doesn't have any, it doesn't bear any relationship to any other experience I've had. It was remarkable. And Patty's birth was, really quick that was only 90 minutes and um in that one uh i also felt completely out of control just completely out of control i really honor and believe in women who are able to take charge of their labors and uh, my labors were pretty good as labors go but i could not pretend for one moment that i was really managing it's also very shocking that after the fact and maybe this is why um women who've been through labor and, and our writers try to grapple around to, to explore it in their writing in some way, because it's so shocking that nobody asks about it afterwards. I didn't want anyone to come to the hospital and ask about the baby. I just wanted to tell them about the pain. Yeah, well, that's interesting because I seem to have formed a bit of a tradition with, with my friends, with my friend Kate, who's here, but my friends in the mountains as well, where we, we told the story. That was the thing. It was like, okay, so first my water's broke. So it, it was quite a sort of tradition amongst us that that was one of the first things that you had to do where you would, you would detail every hour of it. It seemed really important to be able to tell it. And we seemed to share this thing of, I'm going to tell you mine and I need to hear yours. It was very, very, very important. One of the questions we've got, Tegan, is um, have you always been so frank? And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a, it's a little bit of a failing and a little bit of a danger. Um, I'm a bit impulsive and a bit, um, 
not fully under control of what I say sometimes. But I also, um, I really value honesty in other people. And I just don't see any point in not telling the truth. I mean, I don't feel that I need to expose every part of myself to everybody. I'm not trying to kind of strip in front of people. But yeah, I've always found that the best way of making friends is to tell the truth to somebody. Mm -hmm. and, um, that way, that way, you know each other quickly. And, and I've always liked best um, the people who are frank and open and honest. And I would say that characterizes all of my close friendships, people who are able to say things. So it's, that is a really great question. And yes, I have always been like this. <laughs> um, one of the things that I, I really loved about the book was the way that you interwove uh, wove together um, your observations about particular works of literature and, and your response to them and reading and the kind of the personal narratives, your birth experiences, your mother and father, your friendships. And so it seemed to me that you were demonstrating, you were talking about what reading can do. And then you were putting down kind of in perpetuity your own narrative so that it could go forward into the future and maybe affect people in the same way that you have been affected by other works of literature. Was that a conscious thing that you were thinking about? Not really, not really, but the response has been really delightful and has made me realize that um, lots and lots of people read like I do. So lots, lots and lots of people read with the body and read in that very active way. I didn't um, sort of intend to add to to books about reading in a funny sort of a way but I just couldn't stop myself from um, putting it down actually the book in in a lot of ways is a real extension of teaching another of my writer friends said to me the other day she said said a nice thing she said what an amazing mind you have and I said your mind is exactly the same it's just that I have to teach so I'm constantly being forced to articulate what I think about things so um, the book is an extension of having to talk about what it is I'm doing. And because I teach creative writing and I teach reading, it's just that kind of articulation made concrete, I guess. And just as you're saying that, it's making me think something that I wasn't conscious of when I was reading the book, which is that maybe given all of the things you say about reading and your life, it's actually impossible to write a, a straight memoir because the reading would be in the, the, the narrative. And yeah, you've, you've hit it. Yeah, you've hit it. You've absolutely hit it. So I can't imagine living without doing it. It's like I said, I'd feel like I'd have no memory if I didn't read. I can't. It's, it's like, it's like when I, the, the actual act of it, when I'm reading, I read, I read a few pages and then I stop and I kind of look around at things. And quite often I collar my husband as he walks past and make him listen to paragraphs and things like that. So it's quite sort of open, active process, yeah. And when you do that, does he respond with the same level of enthusiasm that you're hoping for? Or... No, he's just, no, no. He, he's a great reader, but he, we, we have a little bit of a, he, he has a daily limit. And he's, I don't know exactly what it is and it depends on the day, but some days he's like, no, I just, I can't, you're just going to have to not. Most days though, I can manage to make him pause for a moment while I read him something and then explain to him why it's so important. And sometimes I do that with the kids and sometimes uh, I do that with um, my friend, my writing friends, Charlotte Wood, Lucinda Holdforth and Vicky Hastrich. We have a rolling conversation, an email conversation where we, often write bits down to each other. Someone once said to me when I was a teenager, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could find a partner and in the evenings you sat in matching armchairs and read the same book and you'd know they were the right person for you because you'd read at the same speed and you'd look up at the same moment and go, ah. Oh. And I thought, isn't that the most beautiful description of a partnership? Um, we've got lots of questions, Tegan, let's see. Vanessa said, I'm really enjoying the disclosures of talking about birth. It's interesting that women are not encouraged to talk about birth for fear of scaring other women. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, I do. I do think about that. And um, it's, again, this is hilarious that I can't see her. Sorry, Katie, I'm just bringing you up again. Kate uh, is actually in that vagina essay. Her daughter, also called Alice, was born six months before mine. And when I said, Kate, tell me about it, she said, 
it's terrible. And that was pretty much the most helpful thing anybody said to me because people telling me about, you know, the music that they'd listened to and the this and the that, not that many people did. Most women are pretty honest about it. Um, and I actually do have one friend who doesn't experience much pain during birth. Wow. She was lying the first time. And then that happened another time. She said, mm, it's just, it's not that bad. It's like, oh my God, what has happened? But actually, Kate, it, it's, it's stuck in my head. We'd been friends for a really long time by the time we had babies and her being honest enough to say to me, it's terrible, really, really helped when it happened because it was terrible and it was, it was a huge help. So I think this idea that we're going to scare women off by explaining exactly what happens is a mistake. I just, the, and the other thing is, and I say this in the essay, when I did hear things about, um, you know, your vagina tearing and all of that kind of stuff. When people told me about that, I really, there's a real part of me before I gave birth. It was like, no, nah, but not me. No, I'll be fine. I'll be good. So you can't really, you can't really scare a woman off birth. I don't think if you can scare a woman off birth, then maybe she doesn't really want to give birth. And yeah, I, yeah, I definitely, definitely think that the more information we have, uh, the better we can go forward. Tegan, Joyce says, what's the most important thing you tell readers when they're reading, especially teens and preteens? Ah, that's a nice question. I tell them what's in the book. Um, so I always say to my students that we are not worrying about spoilers. I never, I, I say you're too grown up to care about that kind of thing. I describe to them what's in the book and why it might be worth reading. So the other day I was trying to, with, with some cash in hand, I was trying to get my son to read um, To Kill a Mockingbird. And I started to describe to him what was in the book to see if I could catch his attention and I couldn't. But then I started to tell him about how Harper Lee and Truman Capote were best friends and how the two of them amazingly produced two of the greatest books of the American 20th century. And I said, and look, there's Truman Capote in the narrative, he's still. And that was the thing that got him interested. Having said that, he has not finished the book yet. But yeah, I try to I try to just tell them what's in the book. I try to wake the words up for them. What's the going rate for getting a teenager to read a book of your choice? Yeah, yeah. Well, 10 bucks, I think, is um, 10 bucks for a book suited to their age. So he's 15. To Kill a Mockingbird is entirely, I mean, you know, you could read that at 11 with no problems. Um, but for an adult book, so if I tried to get him to read Austen at this age, I would give him 20, but um, I don't know that I could get him to read Austen. <laughs> I'm paying my kids to do their um, uh, uh, home learning at the moment. So I think it's a great strategy. <laughs> Look, it's a good one. And I just want to um, bring up a really, really great tip I got from Charlotte the other night where we did a gig together. And she told me that uh, some friends of hers didn't seem to be having any luck with the paying kids to do homework. But they found with their son that if they paid his sister when he didn't do his homework. <laughs> that's amazing. That's, that's straight from Charlotte Wood. That's for you, Alice. You can have that. <laughs> I'll keep that in my back pocket. We've yeah. got one more question, I think, Tegan. Meg says, what kind of literature speaks to your students now? It's a good question. Have you noticed any trends or is there an enthusiasm for reading a physical book? Is there still? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. This whole thing about um, young people being digital natives isn't completely true. Uh, it is in the sense um, of the way they communicate, the digital na natives with their phones, but none of them want to read Kindles. They all want to read books. And um, trends I've noticed, books, books that turn up again and again and again, Marcus Suzak's book, The Book Thief, Every single semester when I ask students to tell me which is, which is their favourite book, that one comes up. Um, because I've been teaching for so long, I've seen lots of surges. So I had a twilight surge, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, I'm, I'm emerging from the Harry Potter surge and from the Hunger Games surge. Um, you, get these, you get these little, for some reason, I don't know why, but about 10 years ago, they seem to be, it's just awful. There just seemed to be a number of women who'd been locked in cellars and things like that for large amounts of their life. 
and had then come out and written books about it. Mm. And I, I really seem to see a lot of young people reading their stories, which I found odd, but, you know. Um, but w I guess, Meg, and I have a feeling you might be my student, Meg. I think I might have just met you last week. Um, I guess what I really find is that the true readers in the class will just read anything. So um, when, if I'm right about Meg being in my class, I asked a group this week, what were they reading? And I got David Foster Wallace. I got George Orwell. I got um, Harper Lee, actually. I got a few kids, uh, quite a lot of kids reading fantasy. Game of Thrones is featuring a lot at the moment. Fantasy's really big. Are they reading Australian writers, Tegan? No, no. Sorry, I'd love to say yes, but I uh, generally I find that they have heard of Tim Winton, mm. and some have heard of Bryce Courtney, and that's that's it. That's really it. I just I can't pretend anything else. So uh, by the time they've had me as a teacher, they've read a lot of Australian literature, but not before. We've probably just come to the end of our conversation, which is so sad because I feel like I could talk to you forever. But I, maybe you could leave us with one last kind of idea, which is if you could get all of us, at least all of the people in the audience and me to, to read something, a book of your choice, what would you choose? That is a beautiful question. Let me just think. I guess, oh, I, really, I, don't, I don't really know the answer. I think, I think the answer might be something, uh, some, some sort of very, very deep early book. So I'm doing a little podcast at the moment where I'm asking authors about the book that they're still in conversation with, the book that you open and still makes you go <gasps> like that. There were a series of early readers by um, a woman called Elsa Homeland Minerick, and they were illustrated by um, who's the dude? Who's the where the wild things are? Morris Sendak. Mm -hmm. the books. There's something odd and weird and spooky and magical in those books. So that would be the book that I would get everybody to read because they started 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 something in me that still hasn't stopped. So that would be what I'd choose. Thank you for that lovely question. My pleasure. It's been so lovely talking to you and oh, you thank too. You to everyone who came. Oh, Alice. Thanks everyone. What And Tegan, what an incredible conversation to uh, eavesdrop on. Friends in the it audience, can't... if you have not read the details, Oh, yes, I better hold up my There it is. There it is. There it is. Is that a picture of you, Tegan? That's me. I that is you, that. isn't it? I thought that, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I'm reading, just for the, for the audience's interest, because a few people have asked me, I'm reading the book of lists. My parents um, would never have allowed the book of lists in our house, only high literature in our house, but uh, we were in a holiday house and I found the book of lists. It was like the internet in a book. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Alice, thank you so much. Thank for you, Alice. These. Thanks so much. Such extraordinary questions. What a treat. I wish that everyone would take themselves off mute now so that we could applaud and you could hear how happy <laughs> this conversation was. It's been that lovely. made everybody feel as if they were part of some movement that uh, will continue and continue and continue. It's so great. Thanks so much, everyone. The author of the Grand Chat, Tegan Daylight, Thanks, the author of the details. Hello, Josephine. Thank you. Thank if you want to see everybody, put yourself on the gallery and uh, <laughs> give everybody a wave. Remember in Zoom, it's always the loudest person wins. <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of readings, on behalf of Simon and Chota, and of course, of bloody Zoom. Bloody yourself, everyone. Take care. Thanks, yeah, everyone, for coming. Right thanks, Chris, and thanks so much, Alice. That was thank quite... you. It's wonderful. See you. Thank you. Very generous. Lovely.